So welcome once again to our online audience, wherever you are. Um, my name's Morgan, and I'm one of the teachers here at Tara Centre. Tonight, this uh, event is a talk about immunity, about the immune system, and boosting uh, the, our immune system in a natural way. And we decided to do this talk to take some positive action, given the recent uh, circumstances. And um, we're going to... The way the structure of this talk will be is to present some information, some general information about the immune system. It's an extremely complex uh, process in our body. But um, if we have a little bit of an understanding on how it works and on how some of the um, lifestyle changes, nutrients and dietary changes, things this, like this affect our um, immune system, then we have a better uh, chance of successfully implementing some kind of strategies that uh, can help us uh, more improve our health. Um, it's a little bit like when you look at the nutritional profile of a um, some food, and uh, like, for example, we've all heard of rose hips, you've heard of rose hip tea, and if you know that that little rose hip has 10 times the vitamin C of an orange, uh, then it's kind of uh, inspiring you to uh, bring that uh, nutrient into your diet. So that's what we want to aim to do a little bit tonight, to not just to give a list of some nutrients or things that can help the immune system, uh, but understand a little bit how they work and in what way they affect it positively or negatively, as the case may be. So first of all, what is the immune system? Well, um, it's a defense system, basically any defense system in an organism that's there to fight against pathogens and fight against disease. Um, a pathogen is basically any disease-causing uh, organism. It could be a, a bacteria, it could be a fungus, uh, it could be a virus. And the, to function properly, the immune system has to detect the pathogens and uh, also uh, keep them out of the body. And if they do reach inside the body, to neutralize them, to, to kill them, basically. Now, it's not just a single system um, like, uh, you know, the circulatory system or something like this. It consists of many different types of tissues, different organs in the body, and a whole host of uh, defense cells, different types of cells that uh, are primary, their primary purpose is to defend against pathogens. Now, when we think of the immune system, we think that it's generally, we tend to think that it's something happening inside us. Uh, like an, an inner process that um, some cells are fighting the infection, killing those pathogens. But actually, this is the second line of defense. We have a primary uh, line of defense, one that is actually uh, acting before this, which is preventing those pathogens from entering our body in the first place. And this primary line of defense, uh, we, this primary part of the immune system, we can think of it like a force field. In the same way you have a, a spaceship and the spaceship is flying through space and when it encounters an alien civilization, it puts up its force field and then it can defend itself against any kind of attack. attack. Well, this primary part of our immune system is a bit like this. It, we have a force field around us because we are beings moving through this uh, world and we are constantly exposed to different organisms. And this uh, force field is like the layer of protection that is around us. So this primary line of defense is external. And external meaning that it's outside our body. Um, it's uh, usually formed of a physical barrier like the skin um, and also the mucus lining of the intestines. Now, when we put something inside our mouth, we think that we're putting it inside our body, but really it's outside. Um, from the mouth to the anus is a tube, and um, it's a little bit like, if you can imagine, uh, a donut uh, inside. If you put something inside the hole, the space of the donut, it's not inside the donut, right? It's still outside the donut. You would have to puncture through the wall to get inside. Well, the human body is a bit like this. We are like a stretched out donut. And when we put something inside, actually it's still outside of our body. 
To get inside, you would have to puncture through those barriers, the barrier being the skin. So when you have a cut in the skin, that's then the uh, pathogens can enter. Um, or um, if something is so small that it can actually penetrate through those membranes, either being absorbed through the skin or being absorbed through the intestinal tract. Now, our entire skin and the inner intestinal tube is covered in bacteria. And it's made out of uh, specific kinds of bacteria. One of the most prominent of all the bacteria is one called Lactobacillus acidophilus. It's probably one that you've heard of, acidophilus. Um, it's one that you find in yogurt cultures very commonly. Um, now, Lactobacillus, the name comes from lacto, meaning milk, bacillus, bacteria, acidophilus, acid, and philos, meaning love or lover. So it's the acid-loving milk bacteria. Um, this is a bacteria which uh, covers our body um, and um, it's one of the forms, the big part of the vaginal microbiome. So when we are born, we're coming out, we're sterile, and as we come out the um, vaginal um, area, we are covered in this uh, microbiome, in this bacteria. Then, welcome, take a seat. Then we would, um, uh, the first thing we would do in a natural situation is we would go to the mother's milk and then we would receive the milk which then coats the intestinal tract with this lactobacillus uh, bacteria. So um, this is essential for um, building this microbiome in the child's gut. Now this lactobacillus uh, acidophilus is an aggressive bacteria. Um, it it kills very actively other organisms. Um, now, the role then of this bacteria later on as it develops and we uh, also, it works with many other kind of bacteria in our system, is for um, helping to uh, destroy uh, pathogenic bacteria and organisms. Um, it also, in the intestinal tract especially, it competes with them, competes with them for food and also for space. Now, the skin biome also prevents pathogens uh, from establishing their uh, colonies on the skin and for basically colonizing the skin surface. We have bacteria all over us, um, all over the skin all the time. Um, we're never sterile as we might try to be. Um, and uh, there are a lot of bacteria on the skin, some of them which we, some of them are harmful, some of them are beneficial, some of them neutral, some of them that we don't even know much about. And um, you, can, you can understand that um, quite simply that when we uh, are washing ourselves with chlorinated water, when we're using all these antibacterial uh, soaps and detergents, um, then we're actually, when we're taking antibiotics, uh, when, um, then all of these things are killing off this beneficial bacteria. This beneficial bacteria is forming this um, force field this initial part of our, um, of our immune system. So um, when this force field is weakened, then things can enter into our body. So um, this is the sort of this first part of the, of the immune system. Now, when things uh, get into the body, then this is when the internal part of the immune system kicks in. So this is the kind of immune response uh, that we might be uh, more familiar with. It's more of a strategic maneuver. Um, this is where the body starts to fire up things like fevers. It starts to release uh, different chemical signals, um, causes inflammation, and all sorts of other uh, defensive tactics. So it's kind of in intelligent, if you like. Um, so the first one is a bit more brute force. It's a bit more simplistic. Um, but this second line of defense, when pathogens enter inside the body, uh, needs to be a little bit more intelligent. Um, this second line of defense, um, this internal, more internal immune part of the immune system um, is made up of, once again, of many different tissues and organs. The organs are called lymphoid organs. Um, you're familiar with some of them, things like the tonsils, uh, the adenoids, um, the appendix is another one, um, the spleen is a big one, and they are responsible for manufacturing the cells, these um, immune cells, 
Uh, they're called white blood cells, and there's many different types of the white blood cells. And um, and then helping to um, distribute them through the body. Now, there are actually uh, many types of these immune defense cells. They're, it's really fascinating how they all work together. Some of them are, they literally just eat up the pathogens. They're a bit like any of you ever played that Pac-Man game back in the 80s? Um, they're a bit like a Pac-Man going through the blood system, um, through the lymphatic system. When they come across a, 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 a microbe, uh, a parasite or uh, any kind of intruder, then they literally eat it up. Um, some of them can only do that once. They eat it and then they die. Um, and you're familiar with that when you have a, like a cut on your skin. Um, and, and often you'll get first inflammation, that's one of the immune responses. Um, then you get um, uh, often pus forming, and the pus is actually the, the dead uh, remnants of these immune cells, these defense cells. There are other cells that can eat the pathogens many times before they die. Um, there are others that are scanning, more intelligent, they scan these pathogens, they see whether the, the cell is <coughs> harmful or not and then they signal it, um, and then they send messages to these eater cells to come along and eat it. So there's a whole complex process going on there. There's also cells which have memory. Um, so you've heard of antibodies. Um, these are part of the, these are formed, these are signaled, uh, the proteins that actually signal when a cell recognizes a pathogen. And when, a, when one of these cells recognizes it, um, it forms a memory and then we can, it can respond to the same kind of pathogens much quicker in the future. So there's a whole range of things going on there. Now, <clears throat> the thing is about this, that these white blood cells, they have a really hard time identifying what is a um, harmful cell and what is a good cell. So it's very difficult for them to know what is an appropriate attack. And sometimes they can overattack. When they overattack, um, this is what we call a autoimmune disease. So these are things like <clears throat> things like irritable bowel disease, um, multiple sclerosis, even rheumatoid arthritis. This is a autoimmune disease. It's when the uh, immune system is overactive, and it's actually starting to kill some of the healthy uh, bodily cells. Then if it's underactive, we also have immune deficiency. So this is when the body's ability to fight disease is decreased and will be more prone to infection. So <clears throat> we've all heard that um, nutrition is in some way good for our immune system, right? We get, it's very common, you see messages, eat lots of oranges, um, have lots of fruit, berries are really healthy, things with antioxidants and lots of high vitamin content. Well, what we can ask here is the question, why is that? Why are certain nutrients and foods helpful for the immune system? And the answer is that it's not just about providing um, food so that the cells can function properly. It's much more than this. Actually, the key here is that there are certain nutrients that can actually um, teach our white blood cells how to work better. Now, this is a really fascinating part uh, because, um, as I said, it's, it's, we, we think that we're, all we're doing by putting nu good nutrients in the body is that we're just giving the right food for our system to function properly. But there's a whole other component to this, that certain nutrients actually teach our white blood cells how to uh, respond and identify pathogens better. So it's a bit like an education. It's like a training. Um, they, um, they are actually teaching our immune system how to work better. If it's overactive, it'll make it calm down. If it's underactive, it'll make it uh, increase its activity. Now, one of these compounds that I want to mention specifically uh, are called polysaccharides. Now, we're familiar with uh, polysaccharides are complex sugars. Uh, we're familiar with simple sugars, the saccharide. So when you have one a sugar molecule, it's called a, a monosaccharide. So where things like glucose in honey, fructose in fruit, um, these are single molecule um, sugars, monosaccharides. Then we have disaccharides, uh, things like uh, sucrose, um, so sugar, which normal table sugar is a disaccharide, it's two sugar molecules. And then 
when you go for more, three, four, five uh, molecules, you have oligosaccharides. And then as you get more and more complex, you get to what's called polysaccharides. Now, what we'll notice is that going from the simple sugars to the more complex sugars, they start to lose their sweetness. An example of a polysaccharide are uh, carbohydrates. So complex carbohydrates, the kind of thing that you would find in potatoes or in grains. Um, and what you'll notice is they're not sweet anymore, right? Especially not compared to uh, glucose or fructose. Now, as we go further along and they become more and more complex, they actually become bitter. They have, this, they have the bitter taste. Now, an example of one of these foods is uh, aloe vera. Have you ever tasted aloe vera? Yeah, have you ever tasted it fresh from a plant? Some of you have. If, if, you, if you have, you'll know how extremely bitter that plant is. If you just cut a leaf straight off the plant, um, it, it's so bitter that it's almost you know, unbearable to eat. Uh, and a lot of the aloe vera products, they actually take away some of this bitterness and you're left with the gel inside, um, which is not quite as bitter. Aloe, uh, actually, the, the word aloe comes from the Arabic term alohe, which means bitter, and uh, vera comes from veritas, the Latin, which means truth, so it's truly bitter. Now, aloe vera is made from polysaccharides. Um, another example of uh, bitter uh, tasting and uh, a plant that is full of polysaccharides are the medicinal mushrooms. Um, now, the medicinal mushrooms have a polysaccharide, it's called a beta-glucan. Now, when these uh, beta-glucans -glu enter the system, they actually dock onto the white blood cells and they upload information to those cells to allow them to function better. Um, it's a little bit like a software upgrade. You know, you have your, your old operating system um, or your old software version and finally the new Windows 10 comes out and all of a sudden it's got more features, it's got more functions, it can do more things, um, it's more powerful, there's more information, there's more intelligence in it somehow. Well, it's a bit like this. The white blood cells are our hardware and these uh, polysaccharides come along they're like the software upgrade. They upload information and they teach that white blood cell and therefore our immune system how to function more intelligently. So they're actually building intelligence into our immune system. So this is um, a really fascinating part of um, the immune system, which I just wanted to share with you. Um, it's a kind of an interesting thing that um, you'll notice that a lot of medicines have a bitter taste. Um, and this is because um, very often the medicinal component of a food has this poly polysaccharide component, it has this bitter taste. Um, now, unfortunately, in our modern uh, eating habits, we, have tended to, we tend to avoid the bitter tasting foods. In fact, in our modern agriculture, we've even bred uh, food to be less bitter. You know, like if you take the original wild carrot, it was only about this big, um, and it was uh, quite. It was, a, it was a bitter tasting. Now, if you compare it to the carrots we have today, they're huge and they're very sweet, and have actually bred this bitterness out of the food. In doing so, we've bred the medicinal component out of the food. We've bred this intelligence, the thing that can actually help train our immune system out of our food. And as a, just as a side note, not that I want to talk about this, but uh, it's just an interesting uh, idea that uh, a lot of the um, wild food foragers, uh, people who are really into you know, uh, collecting food from the wild, um, one of the reasons is because they're collecting food in its more ancient form. So the wild blueberry has much more um, nutrients than say the modern uh, farmed blueberry which is bigger and fatter and sweeter so that's just a little side um, but uh, we as a as a culture have tend to uh, especially in the west lost this ability to uh, handle bitter tasting food and that's actually to our detriment so this was just a little intro into the immune system and some ideas about how it functions just to give a bit, bit of a perspective and so now what I want to move to is a, some steps for how we would go about developing the immune system. And the way I'm going to do this is in a, in a three-step uh, approach. 
and we could take many steps, but this is just the, the way I uh, decided to do it. Um, the first step would be this primary level where we're strengthening the force field. That's that force field around our body, the one on our skin and the one on the intestinal tract. And in fact, on any opening into our body, uh, like the respiratory system is also another opening which has mucus lining and it has its own uh, force field, if you like, uh, its biome. Um, and then uh, the second level would be to increase the intelligence of the immune system. And then third is what uh, we can just call is extra support. This would be things that um, assist the immune system in its function. So they don't necessarily train it long term, but they help it um, in a one time kind of moment. So they could be antibacterial, they could have antibacterial properties or antiviral properties. Um, they could have uh, detoxing properties. So they're helping to just remove all the waste that uh, is left after the normal cell reproduction and um, cell activity. Um, and also in, in this section, I'm going to include some lifestyle um, components as well. So do you have any questions so far about that? Also online, if you have any questions, please write them in the comments and we'll address them at the end of the talk. So then let's look at the first uh, step for developing the immune system. And here we're starting off with this primary level, which would be um, uh, how to strengthen this force field, um, starting with the skin. So the skin has its own biome and we can see that uh, when we, one of the problems is that we're showering and washing in chlorinated water that kills and harms this biome. Uh, we use antibacterial soaps. This also destroys all of the bacteria, including all of the good bacteria. Um, not to mention that it actually contributes to the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, it's not necessary. We don't need to use antibacterial soaps. Uh, we can just use normal soap. Um, and what's important is that we put it under the water for long enough. I don't know if you noticed, but if you've been following any advice for the, um, the coronavirus outbreak, uh, one of the big things has been wash your hands. We have signs up on the wall here. Every time we come in, we ask people to wash their hands. Um, and the main advice is to last for 20 seconds. So um, this is actually all that's needed. Um, it's about the amount of time underwater more than using uh, antibacterial uh, soap, which destroys the biome on your skin. Putting oils on the skin uh, helps to keep the acidity of the skin as well. And remember, these are uh, acid-loving bacteria which help form that uh, force field, that biome around the skin. So the second part of this would be the intestinal tract. And um, now here we enter a big part of the immune system. It's estimated that the intestinal tract is about 80% of our immune system. And so this means that we should give it a tremendous amount of attention if we want to uh, have any chance to boost our immune system and our overall health. Um, they, the, the bacteria in the, uh, in the intestinal tract, they play a very crucial role in um, the operation of the immune system and in the production of antibodies. And um, the thing is that um, the other part of our immune system can't go through our intestinal tract and uh, try to keep balance there. It can't work out what, what bacteria are overgrown, what bacteria are undergrown. And in a way, we've kind of like outsourced this to other bacteria. And um, because our, our immune system and our, our defense cells simply wouldn't be able to, to do this job. Um, so how can we nurture our gut microbiome? The microbiome is basically the uh, family of uh, bacteria that live in the intestinal tract. And we can do very practical things to um, help promote it. And there are also very specific things that we should avoid. So I'm going to list a few practical things now. Um, the first thing to do, the first uh, action that we can do to nurture our gut mi microbiome is by eating fermented or cultured foods. 
Now, fermented or cultured foods have been around for centuries. Um, many ancient cultures have used uh, these foods actively in their diet. Uh, we're talking about things like yogurt, um, uh, kefir. Kefir is a cultured milk product. Um, there are also um, uh, non-dairy forms of both of these, yogurts and kefirs, if, you're, uh, if you don't consume animal products. Um, another uh, form of cultured foods are the uh, sauerkraut um, or, and the pickled vegetables. Uh, these are the particularly prominent in the European uh, cultures. And then in the Asian, Asian cultures, we find things like kimchi. That's the Korean version of sauerkraut, basically. And um, uh, tempeh. Tempeh is fermented soy. Uh, miso, once again, fermented uh, usually soy, but it can also be barley and rice as well. Um, and natto is another one. Natto is a fermented soy. Um, have you ever had natto before? No? Have you had miso? Yes, everyone's had miso. Okay, and uh, tempeh. Have you had tempeh before? No? You had tempeh? Yeah. Tempeh, actually, it's really, it's really uh, common, very really popular in Indonesia. And uh, um, and it's something that you can buy just in you know standard health food stores. Um, it does have an unusual taste. It's not like so, not like tofu. Tofu tofu, by the way, is not a fermented product. It's a processed food, um, and uh, it still has its health uh, benefits. But tempeh um, falls under this category of fermented foods, um, and and therefore eating it can actually help to support the the gut uh, microbiome. Now natto is an interesting one. It's uh, fermented with different cultures. It has a very unusual taste. Um, if you're really experimental and you want to try something different, um, get some natto. It's a very unusual taste. Um, but it has a really extraordinary nutrient profile as well. For example, it has uh, vitamin K in it, which is not in a lot of food. Um, and that works very well with vitamin D in our bodies, So, um, which we'll see later on is one of the uh, essential nutrients for a strong immune system. So. Uh, try these things. Um, there are also other drinks, fermented drinks like kombucha. For sure you've heard of kombucha. That's becoming very popular these days. Um, and these all uh, help with um, feeding um, the, the gut uh, flora. Now, one of the things with these foods, fermented foods, is that we have to do them regularly. We have to introduce these things into our diet. Um, on a regular basis. It's no good just having sauerkraut on your sausage on the weekend. Um, you need to bring them in kind of on a daily basis and it's also good to vary them because the different types, like some of those different ones that I mentioned, they, they have different cultures um, and the more diversity that we have, generally speaking, in the microbiome, um, the stronger it is. Now, the second point here about nurturing our gut biome is uh, the use of probiotics. Now, a probiotic is basically a good bacteria, um, and that's usually in, uh, that's usually a, a supplement uh, that we would take. Uh, generally, I'm not so into taking supplements. Um, I rather that we try to get all of our nutrients from plants. Um, the exception would be when we have whole plant food supplements. Uh, things like when the whole plant is reduced down to a powder or a liquid or something uh, like you get with vitamin C powders when you have the whole fruit is dried and ground into a powder and you're taking that as a supplement then that's really healthy because it's really important to get the, the whole food balance, the whole food nutrient. Um, in the case of probiotics this can be a bit of an exception. Probiotics are usually taken in capsules um, or tablets and they are um, they contain a certain number of strains of bacteria and they have a certain density of bacteria. You'll see they have so many million uh, bacteria uh, units. And um, now the problem with um, uh, taking probiotics is that very often they don't make it uh, enough into the, into the, um, deep enough into the gut. Um, and it's a bit of a numbers game. So it, you're, you're just throwing, it's like you know, pouring a glass of water into a lake uh, and you, you have to do it many times until you have effect on the, you know, the, the actual water in the entire lake. Now, the um, recent um, developments in probiotics uh, use what are called spore-based probiotics. They're probiotics which have a... Um, called spore biotics, they have a kind of a shell and that allows them to go deep into the intestinal tract. But more than this, 
um, these sporebiotics actually communicate with other probiotics, with other beneficial bacteria in the gut and help them grow and help them develop. So while the normal probiotics just take care of themselves, um, the spore uh, biotics uh, actually enhance many of the other beneficial microbes. So this is quite a big step in the use of probiotics. Um, and if you ever have any serious health conditions, um, then it's very advised to look into taking probiotics or if you really want to just boost your immune system, take a dose of them, look into these spore biotics um, and see what they can do for you. So another do is uh, boosting your soluble and insoluble fiber. Fiber is basically the living ground of these, these bacteria. So this is a really essential thing. This just means basically eating more vegetables. Having a, moving towards a more plant-based diet means more fiber, um, and that means more support for the, the biomes. Now, um, another um, point here is get your hands dirty. Get into the garden, do some digging. Um, now, it, it sounds funny, but actually it's serious. When we, when we go into the, into the garden and we put our hands into the soil, we actually expose ourselves to many beneficial bacteria and we can actually re-educate our immune system um, with these beneficial microorganisms which are contained in the plants and in the soil. So I don't know if you have any, if there's any gardening fans amongst you. Yeah. So and you'll notice that when, you, when you're digging in soil, you have that, you know, you can smell it, right? It has a smell and uh, you can really, there's a lot of uh, organisms in the soil and we, we can't, in our kind of, especially in our city life, we tend to get a little bit sterile. Um, like when, when did you actually come in touch with the earth recently? With the actual soil? Probably can't remember. <laughs> and it's kind of, you know, it's a bit, it's quite a natural thing to do, to get in touch with the, the soil, with the earth. Um, so this is one of the, the do's. Now, some things to avoid. Uh, the first big one would be avoid antibiotics, avoid taking antibiotics. Now, of course, when it's necessary, you use them. If you're going to die of pneumonia, um, you're going to take uh, some antibiotics. Um, but um, we would avoid taking them as much as we can. Uh, because the antibiotics, as the name says, they kill the beneficial bacterias um, as well as the harmful ones, um, but they basically destroy the, this um, natural gut microbiome. If we do have to take antibiotics, then we can make use of probiotics. So that's a kind of a must. You need to rebuild the microbiome in the gut, so taking probiotics then is really important. Um, another thing to avoid is uh, tap water drinking just ordinary tap water. Um, now the research shows that the ordinary tap water is full of pesticides and herbicides, um, pharmaceuticals, hormones, disinfectant products. Um, sounds lovely. Anyone want to drink? <laughs> um, and these all have an adverse effect upon our uh, microbiome. Um, now this is a very easy thing to do. You can just simply get one of these carbon filters uh, and you know just those, those simple carbon filters which are about you know 20 pounds like the Brita filter and, and already this is going to go a long way in re removing a lot of these things. And then if you really want to get into it um, you go into more advanced water filtration systems um, so that's something that you can look into but it's an easy easy solution. Another thing to avoid uh, is processed foods. Now processed foods are usually high in sugar. Sugar, uh, excessive sugar feeds the pathogenic bacteria in our system. And very often processed foods have a lot of additives. These additives, things like um, preservatives, um, artificial colors and flavorings and sweeteners, um, these all have adverse effects on the gut bacteria. So artificial sweeteners as well have adverse effect on our gut bacteria. So I'm always a bit uh, annoyed by this kind of um, marketing that you find, you know, where it's like zero sugar. This is healthy. Come and drink our product. It's so healthy. We have zero sugar. And then it's got aspartum in it. And aspartum has all sorts of, uh, does all sorts of things to our, to our body, including one of these creating adverse effects on our microbiome. So it's not a health product at all. 
So avoid artificial sweeteners and as much as we can process foods. Another thing that uh, plays havoc on the gut microbiome are agricultural chemicals. So these are things like um, uh, glyphosate, which you would find in Roundup. Um, and this means that we would try to eat organic food as much as we could. Um, or if not, you can take measures to wash food and to wash some of these pesticides off them. Um, one of the things is that, of course, organic food is a little bit expensive. Um, there are some foods, you can get lists of some foods which, are, uh, which absorb more of these um, uh, chemicals than others. So things like uh, apples, for example, they, they tend to absorb the chemicals and so they're very good to have organic. Uh, things like bananas, on the other hand, don't tend to absorb the chemicals as much, so it's not as bad if you don't have organic bananas. So you can look up online, you can find this kind of list of really dangerous foods for, um, for chemicals and ones that are not so bad, and then you can kind of adjust your buying accordingly. Um, so um, all of these things, uh, by the way, um, meat products contain a lot of antibiotics in them. Um, so, and from, as a yogi, we would encourage not to eat meat for moral, ethical, spiritual reasons. Um, but this is even another reason why we wouldn't eat factory farmed meat because they contain antibiotics. They use a lot of antibiotics in the agricultural, um, in the industrial uh, meat uh, farming. And, and these make their way into our bodies when we consume them. So all of these things are about... Um, this primary uh, part of the immune system. Yeah, so the skin, the intestinal tract, this, uh, this is our uh, force field. Uh, this is there to defend against any pathogens entering our system. Remembering that the intestinal tract there is considered to be uh, of about 80% of our immune system. So we should really consider this as the primary line of defense. Um, the the internal part we could consider is the secondary line of defense. Ideally, we want to get to the situation where, where this primary force field is so strong that we never have to go through those secondary immune responses. So it's just a, I just would like to give this as a, an idea of looking at this part of our immune system. And you might think differently about um, you know, the, the water that you drink or the water that you shower in. By the way, uh, one practical method there for showering is you can get filters for your shower that take out the chlorine, um, and this can drastically improve the quality of our water that we shower in. We absorb a lot more chlorine through showering than we do through drinking. People are very uh, quick to jump on the water filter for drinking, but the first thing we should do is actually put filters on our showers. Um, you can buy them online, they're quite cheap, um, put one on your on your shower and you'll have a much healthier washing experience. So this is the primary system. Let's look at the secondary level. Uh, the secondary, uh, so the first step is improving this um, force field. The second step of improving our immune system is to increase its intelligence. So now we're going to look at the intelligence there. Do you have any questions before we move on with any of these things? Makes sense so far? Yep. Okay. So let's move then to the next stage, which would be to improve the intelligence of the immune system. Um, now, as we mentioned there before, we have these, um, um, these com components, these um, polysaccharides, I mentioned the specific type of beta-glucans, which we find in medicinal mushrooms. Now, um, mushrooms have been used for thousands of years, uh, and it's not really until recently that modern medicine has started to confirm some of their benefits. A lot of um, antibiotics, by the way, are taken from chemicals that are taken out of mushrooms. Um, the mushroom that we're familiar with is actually the fruiting body, like the little standard field mushroom that you would buy, or button mushroom you'd buy in the store, is actually the, the fruit of the plant, um, which, and the body is actually underground, it's called the mycelium, and, and it forms a huge network um, which um, consists of the body of, of the actual mushroom. 
Now, these are extremely interesting uh, organisms. Um, they are, can, can be considered nature's recycling recyclers. They recycle organic matter. And um, the world-leading mycologist, Paul Stamets, he described them as the Earth's internet um, because they have shown to distribute nutrients and information within the forests and under the ground. Um, they've also shown learning capacities, being able to adapt and to learn. And just a little fact for you, the largest living organism on the earth, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's a mycelium. It's a, it's a mushroom mycelium. It's in uh, Oregon. It's about 2,200 acres. Um, and it's been alive for over 2,000 years. Yeah. So just a little interesting fact. Uh, mushrooms are fascinating um, and if you, I really encourage you to look into them. There's plenty of wonderful doc documentaries on them nowadays uh, about the incredible properties of mushrooms. But what we're talking about now, specifically relating to the immune system, are the medicinal type of mushrooms. Um, now many medicinal mushrooms have strong anti-inflammatory, um, anti-viral, uh, anti-tumor, antibacterial and anti-fungal properties. But what is really interesting is the way uh, these can modulate the immune system. As I was mentioning er earlier, these uh, beta-glucans can help to train um, the defense cells to identify pathogens. Um, and another way that they do this is by um, inc improving the communication between the defense cells. So remember, uh, there are some cells which they go along and they scan one of the pathogens. They scan to see whether it's um, harmful or not. And then they tag it and then they send some communication back to one of these eating cells which comes along and destroys it. Now, one of the things that mush medicinal mushrooms do also is they improve this communication. So this process is much faster. Um, Mushrooms are also, uh, many of them are also adaptogens. Uh, an adaptogen is a food that has this ability to protect our bodies from the harmful effects of stress. And um, they, they, they're quite literally helping our body to adapt to itself, adapt to whatever its physiological and emotional needs are. So uh, adaptogens are really uh, important substances. Um, and you can find many herbs that are adaptogens. Uh, things like ashwagandha, that's from the Ayurvedic uh, medicine. Um, it's an adaptogenic herb. And what they, they're, they're different in the sense that many other herbs are often either stimulants or relaxants. Uh, whereas these do both. They can stimulate when we need to and they can relax us when we need to. So they're um, really helpful components to have in our arsenal. So the medicinal mushrooms have many other nutritional benefits. Um, one of the things is that they're... Um, they're non-toxic, so you can have uh, huge amounts of them without them becoming toxic. Um, and the efficacy of the mushrooms is very often proportional to the amount that we take. Now, that's not the case with many other substances. For example, vitamin D. Uh, if you take too much vitamin D, that does become toxic. But it's not the case with many of the medicinal mushrooms. Um, and that means that they can be uh, used um, to... Uh, their, their use is much more broad. Um, and another practical advice here is that it's good to use uh, a blend of mushrooms, so more than one type. It, the research shows that uh, using a blend is much more um, efficient than using just one type of medicinal mushroom. So um, to list some of the mushrooms, uh, the first one is called shiitake. Shiitake is one of the mushrooms. Have you heard of this one, shiitake? Yep. You find it in the grocery store nowadays. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy to use in your ordinary cooking. Um, it has a fairly strong taste, um, but uh, it's is considered one of the medicinal mushrooms. Um, and so that's a very easy one to bring into your, into your diet immediately. Um, the next one is called reishi. Uh, reishi is uh, considered one of the most uh, important of the medicinal mushrooms. Its Latin name is Ganoderma lucidum. Um, in China, it's called the spirit plant, and also, and also it's been called the mushroom of immortality, just to give you a little bit of an indication as to how highly they regard this mushroom. Cordyceps is another mushroom. I'm not going to go through all of the qualities of them. It's, it'll take too long, and, and you can look them up just to give you a list of some of the main ones. 
Um, Coriolis is another one. It's also called turkey tail. Um, this is one of the most widely researched of all the medicinal mushrooms. So there have been really large clinical trials. The National Institute of Health in America did a seven-year trial. Um, it went for... Uh, it cost over $2 million, um, and that was on the effects of Coriolis on um, cancer patients, and there were many positive outcomes with that. But these are the kind of clinical trials that have, um, have been uh, used with medicinal mushrooms. Another of the great mushrooms is Chaga. Uh, this is by the mu medicinal mushroom um, aficionados, considered the king of the medicinal mushrooms, um, and another one is called Lion's Mane. So these are just some of them. Um, you can do more research. Um, how you can take them, uh, you can buy them online in health food stores. They come in uh, capsule form. They come in powder form. Um, and some, uh, they, they are, um, the nutrients are extracted differently from different mushrooms. So some of them, for example, are hot water extracted, which means um, they need to be uh, cooked or they need, you can have them in teas in order to extract the nutrients. You can't just eat them raw. Um, but generally, when you buy them, um, they'll indicate what kind of uh, the kind of way that you can actually consume that mushroom. So this was what I wanted to say about boosting the intelligence of the immune system using medicinal mushrooms. Um, this is one of the best things, um, and uh, we can introduce those things very easily into our diet. So with this, we go to the third third level, the third step, if you like, of boosting our immune system. So the first was increasing the, that force field. The second was increasing the intelligence of the immune system. And, and what I want to speak about now are just some extra um, support that we might offer. Um, and the first would be just extra defense. So this is when we want to bring um, a uh, extra defense into our um, uh, to support our immune function. Um, here there are some foods that I would like to mention. One of them is garlic. And garlic is one of the best antibacterial and antiviral and antifungal foods that we know of. Um, and, uh, but here we should use it as, we use it like an antibiotic, right? We actually use it to kill bacteria. So um, it shouldn't be something that we necessarily take every day, but it's certainly when there's viruses around, like Right now, um, and when there's um, uh, when there's infections, and when we have an infection, uh, then garlic is one of the first things that you can go to uh, to help boost um, the immune system. Um, now, garlic also is pretty strong. One of the best ways to take it is actually raw, just taking the raw clove and eating it down, um, having it with a drink or with some food. Um, of course, that means um, you might not want to have some close contact with people immediately after that, or you might not be very popular. Um, now, if you do want to do that, um, you can use a thing called aged garlic extract. Aged garlic extract is actually a fermented form of garlic, and it doesn't have the same odor. Um, and the many um, evidence shows that it actually increases the medicinal quality of garlic many times. So you can look into that aged garlic extract. It's a good one to have as your in your arsenal to help your immune defense. Um, another one to mention is bee pollen. Uh, bee pollen is one of nature's most complete superfoods. It has all of our all of the known amino acids, so all of the essential amino acids plus the other known amino acids, a complete protein. It has, it's full of enzymes and coenzymes, fats, minerals, vitamins. Um, it really is, if there is such a thing as a superfood, then pollen definitely deserves to be called a superfood. Um, it shown, it's shown to decrease inflammation as well as improve immunity. So this is one of the ways in it works, is helping to regulate the, this inflammation process in our immune system. Another um, extra defense we can employ is vitamin C. This is one of the common ones that we hear about. Um, now, vitamin C has two main functions. Um, first of all, uh, it has a powerful antioxidant effect. Now, an antioxidant is something that removes potentially damaging, oxidizing agents in our body. These are things that are left over from cell reproduction, cell death, and so on. Um, and uh, it's just an ordinary cell function. Um, and so um, the antioxidant component of vitamin C helps to remove it so everything can function normally. 
Now, secondly, it also supports certain functions within the immune system. And part of that is actually part of this um, microbial killing, the way that the, some of these defense cells can actually kill the pathogens. So it increases their killing capacity. This is what vitamin C is doing there in the immune system. Um, it's also something that can be used in high dosage, do, dosages. Um, it's water soluble, so if you take too much, it'll be eliminated from the body. And um, and there is a tremendous amount of research done with using really high dosages. Um, so often you get capsules of like 500 milligrams or even a thousand milligrams, um, and it, it's. Uh, uh, the, the standard kind of advice is that you can take up to 2,000 milligrams if you want to do really high doses, dosages of vitamin C. This is hundreds of times the recommended daily allowance, but um, it's already, um, if you're using it for, for fighting um, some kind of infection, then this is the kind of thing that you want to go for. Now, to, uh, you know, with, with um, vitamin C, we often hear eat oranges and citrus fruits. Um, they're really good. Um, your orange has about 50 um, milligrams per 100 gram of vitamin C. But there are other foods. I mentioned rosehip in the beginning. Rosehip has about uh, 450 to 500 milligrams. So it's about 10 times the vitamin C content. Um, perhaps you've heard of another one called acerola. Um, this is one that's becoming more popular in health food. Well, it has about 1,600 milligrams. And um, getting to the top of the list, we have a plant called Camu Camu. Uh, Camu Camu, um, I've never heard of this. Um, it's, a, it's a fruit um, and um, it has around close to 3,000 milligrams. So that's about 60 times the vitamin C content of oranges. So if you really want to get um, powerful here, uh, look into some of these really high concentrated vitamin C foods. You can eat them as whole plant foods like plant powders. You can buy acerola, camu camu, rosehip as a powder and you can just simply add it to a drink or add it to your smoothie um, and you know a teaspoon of that is like eating 10 oranges. Um, so this is a really great way of getting a high vitamin C into your system. Now Another um, thing that we can bring in as an extra defense are essential oils. Now, essential oils are made quite popular in the whole um, aromatherapy uh, practice. Uh, oils are basically extractions made from plants. They're usually um, distilled. Um, you distill the oil out of the plant, like mint, for example. It goes through a distillation process, uh, which removes the, the, the mint oil. And... Um, the thing is that inhaling the aromas from oils, um, this stimulates the, the limbic area of the brain, uh, which has a big influence on emotions. Um, and this is why uh, aromatherapy is very much connected to um, having a positive impact on human emotion. Things like lavender, uh, which, are, which is kind of calming, removing stress, a chamomile, which is relaxing, uh, things like rose and uh, ylang ylang, uh, jasmine, they are things which improve the mood. They're like uh, mood enhancing. Um, but um, some essential oils also have potent antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal properties. Um, and these are not to be uh, ignored. Um, some of them can kill really harmful bacteria strains, things like Salmonella, uh, E. coli, um, even, uh, even MRSA. MRSA is the dreaded staph infection that just keeps uh, developing more and more antibiotic resistance. Um, and uh, some essential oils have been known to be effective even against this kind of infection. Now, one of the things that we can do is that we can um, inhale these oils and we can also apply them topically <clears throat> and we can also in ingest them. Now, a little word of warning, if you're going to ingest essential oils, you need to be very careful. Um, that needs to be done with a, um, a carrier oil um, and you need to kind of know what you're doing there because they're very strong. And, um, and what I can do now is let's do a little actually practice. Um, first of all, I need to get something. I just want to do a little practice with you here. Um, sorry for those of you online. 
if you've got some essential oils, you can try this at home. Um, and for those here, what we'll do is just a little uh, practice with the with the um, essential oil. One of the ways to do it is that you can simply take the oil, put it into the palm of the hand, uh, rubbing the palms together, and then inhaling the oils. Wait till my assistant brings our oil. She's having trouble finding my bag. Um, in the meantime, I will list some of the some of the oils um, that can be used. Um, and now these ones are specifically mentioned for the um, antibacterial and antimicrobial kind of properties. Thanks. So, so the way we can do this, um, this is mint oil, and we can, just take, uh, we can just take a drop and put one drop onto our palm. and um, rub the palm together, and then cut the hands over the nose. And with some of the oils, they're really strong, especially mint, so close your eyes, and then inhale through the nose, deeply filling the lungs, and then exhaling through the mouth. So, do you wanna just pass that around? And this one is tea tree, yeah? So you can, you can also try this one. Tree. So just take one drop, try just to get one drop, you might get two of them, and put it on the palm and rub it into the palm. You can help each other if you want to do it. Careful not to touch your eyes, by the way, with this, because it's really strong and it'll sting. Okay, and then just rub the palms together, cup your palms like this, over your nose, and inhale deeply. Not over your eyes, keep your eyes closed. And you can just literally take four or five breaths, nice deep breaths, getting into your lungs. Manuka oil. Huh. From as what the plant that they that manuka honey is made from. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I know manuka is very important. Um, I mean, manuka honey has very high antibacterial properties. Um, honey does, generally speaking, but manuka honey specifically. You can also, when you're finished, you can rub it in the palms, and you can even rub it on the back of your neck. Um, and rub it into your and some of the oils will actually be absorbed into the skin. How's that? What's that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was just saying for the online people um, about uh, a question was asked about manuka oil and um, which has very high antibacterial antimicrobial properties and um, like manuka honey does as well and uh, yeah so how was it how was the it's strong yeah you're really intense yeah you're going like this those who are going like that you must have the mint oil because mint uh, often is yeah yeah so um, you'll notice that in the yoga center, one of the things we've been doing is um, using oil diffusers and having them running, putting out essential oils. So that's a really good way of having, uh, of releasing essential oils. Um, the it used to be oil burners, you know, with the little candle, and then you have the putting the water there. Um, but they're not as effective as the diffusers. Diffusers you can have running for hours at a time, um, and it, it distributes the the oil uh, much better. So um, oil diffusers is a great way you can have running. One of the things we've been doing is just spraying water mixed with essential oil into the air. Um, and, um, and then of course, inhaling it in the way that I just said now. So uh, one of the practices I'm doing 
um, in this uh, current viral outbreak is doing this on a day-to-day -day basis um, many times throughout the day three four five times basically whenever I remember um, I'm using eucalyptus oil actually I'll, I'll give you some a list of some of the beneficial oils but I'm using eucalyptus and mint and tea tree um, these are the primary ones I'm using and just doing this inhalation many times throughout the day yeah had a question Is that, so the question was, can you do it too much, <laughs> too many times? Yeah, well, as, as you saw, um, the, when you inhale mint, it's, it's quite strong. And so, yeah, just you would use common sense with it. Um, but, yeah, so, um, so the oils, uh, now just to mention some of them, um, uh, and the first one I would put on the list is tea tree oil. Um, one of, that was one of the ones that went around, tea tree oil. Um, this has been used by the Australian Aborigines for centuries, uh, perhaps even tens of thousands of years, we don't really know. Um, and it's a potent antibacterial and antiviral, uh, an antifungal. Um, and it has compounds which appear to support the functioning of the white blood cells. So it directly, not only is it... Uh, is a defense, like is an extra defense, helping to kill pathogens, but it actually helps boost the immune system. Tea tree oil is one of the most uh, researched of the, of the essential oils, um, and it's kind of the most common one that you'll find used for this kind of purpose. It's used for sterilizing uh, uh, things as well. Uh, peppermint, that's one that we used just now. Mint, this is a fantastic one. Um, it's a bit of an all-rounder. Um, uh, oregano oil, this is a very strong uh, oil which has been shown to be effective against some pretty serious infections, things like E. coli, staph, salmonella. Uh, bergamot, bergamot oil, that's the, that's the oil that you have in Earl Grey tea. Yeah, so you can get the, you can get the uh, Earl Grey uh, tea, I think you can overdose on Earl Grey tea, or you can get the oil. Um, and uh, that's also been shown to kill parasites, by the way, um, and it's really good for mouth ulcers, cold sores, the herpes virus, um, and even things like chickenpox. Thyme oil, this is another powerful essential oil to use. Um, this one's also been shown to be effective against really serious uh, infections like staph. Lemongrass is another powerful essential oil. Um, uh, lavender. Lavender's more famous for its mood-enhancing uh, properties, so uh, I'll bring it into the next section when we talk about stress and relaxation. Um, it's a good one to use for relaxation and releasing anxiety and stress, so it's a great mood enhancer but, um, or uh, mood effector, but uh, it also has very strong antibacterial, antiviral properties. Eucalyptus, another one. Cinnamon, uh, this is also considered one of the strongest uh, antibacterial oils. So this is a little bit about essential oils. Um, you can use them in th the ways that I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, some of the yeah, so the question was, can you apply them directly on the skin uh, or should you use a carrier oil? And um, it is considered that some of them are too strong to apply directly on the skin. I don't know if you, any of you feel now, if any of you use the peppermint oil, can you feel it on the back of your, or your neck? Or if you touched your face somewhere, you probably feel it on the skin. So peppermint oil is, is quite a strong one that usually you wouldn't apply um, like directly uh, and you could you, you use a carrier oil. Yeah. Um, but that being said, um, you can, uh, people have different sensitivities. Uh, like individually, so I think it's also something that you can explore a bit individually. Um, but kind of, I would say the general recommendation is that to be careful when you're applying them topically to use a carrier oil, and especially when you're ingesting them. Um, when you're ingesting them, you use very small quantities, so something like oregano oil can be ingested. You would ingest it in, a, for example, a spoon full of honey um, or a spoonful of a carrier oil. So it, you, would have, you would use quite a lot, like a, a big tablespoon kind of thing, size. Um, and then you can ingest it. Um, it's very potent. So, um, yeah. Yep. 
so the question was, can the oils be combined? Yes, they absolutely can be combined. Um, and uh, the research shows that when we combine oils, their, their, their efficacy is enhanced quite a lot. So it seems that um, uh, some oils do tend to support one another. Yeah. Okay, so so they, they were some of the uh, enhancers that we have. Now let's move to the last little section I want to talk about, which were some lifestyle habits that we can employ that can also help to boost our immune system. And the first is sleep. So we hear this one pretty often. Sleep is good for your immune system. And, um, and indeed, sleep does play an integral role in, in our immune function. Um, and one of the surprising um, mechanisms behind this is how sleep affects your gut microbiome. So we're back to the gut microbiome again. Remember, um, it represents about 80% of your immune system. So, you know, it's worth talking about that more. Um, and the research shows that uh, the gut microbiome are under circadian control, which means that when you disrupt sleep, um, then you can actually have negative effects on your gut microbiome. So circadian rhythms uh, are basically natural rhythms, uh, natural biological rhythms. Um, all biological systems have these rhythms. In the human body, very often they talk about uh, these three phases, a phase of digestion, the phase of assimilation of nutrients, and the, and the phase of elimination. Um, so that's one of the circadian rhythms. But basically, our, our organism uh, works on cycles. Um, and when we interrupt these cycles, then we actually affect um, the health of our microbiome. Now, the interesting thing about this is it goes both ways. Um, it's a bi-directional communication uh, between the gut and the brain. Um, there are actually an entire nervous system in the gut. It's called the enteric nervous system. It's a separate nervous system to the central nervous system. So it has a kind of intelligence of its own. And there is a very active communication between uh, the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system. Um, this means that uh, when the microbes are affected, your sleep is affected. And when you disrupt your sleep, your biomicrome is affected. So the research then shows that there is a very uh, strong connection uh, between our gut microbiome, the quality and quantity of the sleep that we have, and our immune function. Now, specifically related to... Uh, so sleep is affecting so many of our biological functions, but if we talk specifically about how it can relate to exposure to virus, there have been studies done on this, um, and it showed that um, the participants who slept a minimum of eight hours uh, per night uh, showed greater resistance to that specific virus. Um, those who slept seven hours or less were about three times, three percent more likely to develop the virus after exposure. So that's very interesting. Um, that's specifically related to exposure to virus. Um, and uh, it seems that, that when these kind of studies show that the adult sleep duration is between seven to nine hours. Now, um, it's interesting to note that after nine hours, the health benefits drop off very quickly. So if you sleep more than nine hours, it really decreases quickly. On the other side, it's a bit slower. So if you sleep six hours, it's not quite as dramatic. Five hours, it starts going down. And then under five hours, it really drops off dramatically. But, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question was about whether this, when the sleep pattern is broken. Um, and, and, and yes, like um, here it's talking about one continuous sleep duration and not like many sleep cycles broken up over the day. Um, but this, these studies were talking about that, not the total duration of sleep throughout the day. It was in one sleep cycle. Well, actually, I mean, there are actually many cycles throughout one sleep duration, but in one... In one uh, action of sleep, one night sleep, yeah. Um, now, one of the things, sorry, you had a question? Uh, I'm just curious, um, like, is there like an awake state where you're like awake
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so the question was about how to improve uh, a sleep duration, and the question was uh, that uh, sleeping only six hours, and whether you can, even when you've got no reason to wake up, that's how long you sleep for. Um, yeah. So, first of all, it's it is very individual. And um, there's a tremendous amount of studies done on sleep and there's a lot of new studies being done all the time. And some of the recent things that I've looked at show that um, for some individuals, six hours is the optimum amount of sleep that they have. And that would be the equivalent to this study which said about nine hour, uh, eight, eight and a half hours or so it was. So it does defend, depend on the individual. The other thing is um, this interesting relationship between the, you know, the gut microbiome and our sleep and whether if the health of that is going to, af- to affect our sleep duration. So it can be something that you can look, in, look into. If you're a person, for example, that's had antibiotics and done kind of quite a lot of antibiotic use, has a problem with digestion, um, has a lot of anxiety, this kind of thing, then for sure there is some issue there that can be looked at that is going to affect the sleep duration. If you're a person who has great immune system, who's healthy, who's positive emotions, who hasn't, who has a really good digestion and generally the other physiological um, measures are showing well, then it may not be such a, an issue. Yeah. Um, one of the things is also to affect the quality of it. So um, we, we, it's not, so it's duration, but also quality. And there are some practical things that are given as recommended recommendations. First of all, to sleep in complete darkness. So uh, even, this is, even the smallest amount of light um, can affect the pineal gland, uh, and the pineal gland is what will influence the release of serotonin and melatonin um, in the brain. Um, and uh, these are what basically disrupt the sleep cycle. So uh, what we need to do is have blackout blinds, uh, you need to, or you can also wear these kind of eye masks. Um, you need to turn off any lights in the room. Like even if you have uh, an alarm clock with a light, then it should be removed or covered. Um, and it does matter on the the spectrum. So the blue light uh, and is is one that actually affects uh, this um, this melatonin production. Uh, so what we should do also is reduce the kind of blue light activity that we have late at night. Um, this is something that's becoming a bit more known. All of the laptops now, in, in the modern software upgrades, um, they have um, a night, uh, a light uh, timer. Have you seen that? So, yep, if you're using laptops at night, um, you can adjust, you can even set it on a schedule to reduce the blue light, and so it goes kind of, the screen goes kind of red. Yeah. Yeah, so dimming the intensity is not enough. Um, it, you need to. It helps, but um, you you actually want to change the the frequency of the light. So you want to move away from using light in the blue spectrum, and red light is okay. Red light doesn't seem to have the same impact on the pineal gland and influencing the production of melatonin, and therefore the sleep cycle. If you get up in the night, you need to go to the toilet. Have a red light. Um, don't put on the normal light because it's it contains a lot of yellow. Um, so yeah, uh, this is one thing to do. Um, another is to, um, I, I remember when I first encountered this was when I slept in a basement and the basement had no windows, um, it was when I was in North America and uh, I'd never slept in a basement before and I went down there and, you know, to sleep and I slept for like 15 hours or something and I just woke up and I came out and it was halfway through the next day and I just, because it was completely dark and I never had that experience before. And actually got me thinking about it and even researching into this about uh, sleeping in total darkness. So if, you don't, if you've never done it, really try it and that can help improve the, the quality of sleep. Um, eliminating EMFs, eliminating electromagnetic frequencies. This is a, a big one. They disrupt the production of melatonin and serotonin and, and therefore uh, disrupt our sleep cycle. So turn your phones off on airplane mode. Um, also, even, even Wi-Fi um, has an impact on this. Um, uh, the th- one thing I used to do in my apartment when I was living alone was I just switch everything off at the, um, at the socket 
Um, you could even switch things off at the circuit breaker if you have the chance to do that. Um, and uh, if you really want to research this, you can buy little electromagnetic frequency um, detectors and they can detect the kind of frequency that you're exposed to in your bed uh, when the lights are on, when the electric equipment is on, when the TV is on and so on. Um, and that'll give you some um, objective feedback on the kind of electromagnetic frequency that you're exposed to all the time. Um, that's a big one which raises a big concern in our modern times when our electromagnetic uh, exposure is about to go up, it's about to skyrocket. Talking about 5G. Yeah, it's about to go up a lot and so we're going to see different effects from that, health effects. Great. So this is, this is um, what I have to say about sleep. The next one has to do with stress. And um, stress plays, um, when we're stressed, this suppresses the immune system and um, and chronic stress actually desensitizes us to some of the inflammation hormones, things like cortisol. So our body, inflammation is one of the natural immune responses. But when we become desensitized, we'll go into over-inflammation. And this is the cause of many diseases. Um, so stress is uh, a, has a big impact on uh, actually suppressing the immune system. So what do we need to do? We need to employ uh, stress management techniques. Um, one of the first things we can say is being in nature, um, practicing yoga, meditation, laughter is a great one. So whenever I'm feeling a little bit stressed and I've got a deadline or something or haven't had enough sleep, first thing I do is put on a little bit of comedy and uh, have a laugh. Um, we've been laughing at all the corona jokes recently, which <laughs> have maybe some people <laughs> might not find funny but yeah they've been helping us get through this period and find the the lighter side of things um, and a great practice is abdominal breathing one of the things that we tend to do when we're stressed and especially if we have poor posture is we we're likely to breathe high in our chest and this kind of breathing actually um, triggers a stress response so when we do this shallow breath this kind of breath in the thoracic and clavicular area, um, it actually triggers a stress response and it makes us feel more stressed. So one of the things that we can do is just consciously do abdominal breathing. Um, and that's a very simple practice, just with the spine straight. You can even do it now, you can try it. Um, and you can even place your hand on the abdomen and when you breathe in, push the abdomen out rather than have the whole chest expand up and down. So it's more like this kind of breathing. So just abdominal breathing. Using your diaphragm, you have to push the diaphragm down rather than lifting the shoulders and expanding the chest. Now, you can feel that. This is, this is a practice that, um, one of the ones I do, I've looked at many different little breathing exercises that have been recommended by uh, you know, health professionals. Um, some of them have to do with uh, controlling the time of the breath, like you breathe in for five seconds and then you breathe out, or five counts and breathe out for a count of seven. But actually what I find is the, probably the biggest impact is just that it brings awareness to your emotional state. You feel stressed, but you, you're not really aware of it. And then when you do a little breathing exercise like this abdominal breathing, actually you just become aware that you are stressed. And then just that awareness in itself is enough to help you to calm down. So this is um, one of the very practical and very efficient techniques for managing stress. Abdominal breathing and bringing awareness to um, your feelings. And especially at this time when we're undergoing a pandemic, when you're stressed about the stock market crashing or how much toilet roll you've got left in the cupboard, um, we need to be a little bit uh, more vigilant and uh, <laughs> So we need to intentionally employ stress management te techniques in this period. We're going to go into most likely a kind of a lockdown period. Uh, people are isolating, people are getting stressed, there's a lot of fear. Um, so um, be conscious about the, the emotions that you're feeling. A lot of people, uh, it's very easy to get drawn into that uh, because this is a serious time. After all, it's not something that we can just shrug off. We do have to take it seriously and take serious action. But at the same time, we have to be careful that we don't end up um, debilitating our immune system and our health by going into these uh, um, stressful emotions. 
Um, and actually, this leads us to the last thing I want to talk about, which is the emotions. And yeah, yeah, and um, and that is that uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of research that shows that positive emotions improve immune response and function, and negative emotions weaken it. Um, there are two emotions uh, I want to speak about anger. There were studies done that uh, shown that, um, this was one study that was done in Harvard University, and it showed that when people recalled an angry experience, so not if they were angry, but they recalled an angry experience that they previously had, then um, there was a six hour dip in antibody levels. So that was just recalling an angry, ex angry experience that they had. And then conversely, experiments were done to show that when people fell in love, uh, it was actually affecting the genes which control our immune system. Uh, and um, it showed that uh, these genes produced more interferon, which was uh, a protein used to fight viruses in the human body. So there was a direct rel rel correlation between this feeling of love and, and um, uh, and the upregulation of the immune uh, response uh, to viral infections. So there's a lot that can be said about this, but to essentialize it, the main thing is um, about becoming aware of our emotions. Just simply, uh, the, all of our all of the um, correct use of our emotions is grounded in becoming aware of them first of all. So this is something that we need to do uh, consciously, especially during this period. Be really aware of the emotions that we have and that we maintain on a day-to-day -day basis. If you think that you've had a bit of a stressful time and that you're starting to enter into that stressful fear, anxiety kind of energy, just like, intentionally um, counteract it with some positive feeling. Watch something funny, watch something beautiful. By the way, just to mention something beautiful, did you know that... Uh, in, I was, uh, in Venice, the water is all cleared up and they're seeing uh, dolphins in the canals. Um, and there was reports about you know, the pollution in Wuhan, how it's all it's clear now and things like this. And so there are some positive things that we can take from this. And actually, if we look at this whole um, situation that we're in in the moment, we can take a positive side on it. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that you're not taking it seriously. Uh, Doing this, what we're doing now, taking active me measures to support our immune health is a very responsible thing to do. It's one of the most responsible things we can do in this kind of period. So, um, but we can choose to take this positive side of it. Um, it's, it's making people look a little bit more closely at how they treat their bodies, how they relate to their emotions, how they um, relate to their friends, the things that are important to them in life. So um, the way society is functioning as a whole. So there's going to be some positive things out of this and it's good for us to stay oriented in that direction. So if you have any questions, last minute questions before we end. Yeah? Online. We have an online one. Go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, the question was to do with water. Is there something better to wash your vegetables in than just tap water? Um, uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, apple cider vinegar is a great solution there. Um, you can use a dilution of apple cider vinegar with water or you can just simply have it in a spray bottle. Um, you can spray your vegetables with it. So um, that's a, a great solution. Yeah. Uh, but basically, if you've got one of these filters, like a Brita filter, I use it for everything. I use it for cooking, I use it for washing the vegetables, um, and I use it for drinking. So, yeah. And you had a question? Just Yeah. Tea tree. Tea tree. It's a native uh, Melaleuca plant, uh, native to Australia. Yes, tea tree oil is uh, is very readily available in uh, health food stores. Things like ha Holland and Barrett, really kind of standard health food shops, have it, um, and it's relatively cheap as well. Yeah, it's been one of, probably one of the most widely used uh, and researched um, due to its anti, uh, to kind of its uh, sterile properties and its antibacterial properties. Yeah, so. Is there a big 
regular honey. Yeah. So is there is there, the question was is there a big difference? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah. So the question was about different types of honey. Um, is there a difference? Um, so yeah, you've got um, your standard kind of Tesco honey, which is usually pasteurized, um, which is killing a lot of the beneficial bacteria in it. Um, and then you have raw honey, which is, hasn't gone through that kind of process. So this would be considered superior in its um, role in supporting the immune system and general health. And then you've got honey, special honeys like manuka honey. And manuka honey is um, just shown to have very high antimicrobial uh, properties. It's just an exceptional honey due to the, um, to the flower that it's harvested from. So yeah, um, but, but manuka honey is something that you would take as a medicine. I mean, it's not something you would just kind of put in your tea. Um, it's too expensive to do that anyway. Um, but, but take it as a medicine. You take it as a spoon, put it under the tongue, uh, take a time to absorb it. Um, and this is the kind of way. Yeah, it's excellent for the throat, yeah. Yeah, online. Uh, it's actually a really good question. Oh, sorry. Do, the question was, <laughs> I'm getting used to this. Excuse me. Um, the question was, do medicinal mushrooms need to be organic? And that's a really good question because, uh, yes, uh, mushrooms are extremely good at absorbing the nutrients from their environment. So mushrooms are one of the things that we should uh, do organic. Yeah. Uh, so they, they absorb all sorts of uh, chemicals. If it's a toxic environment, they'll absorb them. You know, they sent a robot into one of these um, um, uh, nuclear fallouts uh, and they discovered mushrooms in there munching away on, on the radioactive material. So uh, mushrooms can absorb all sorts of things. So yes, uh, they should be organic. Um, many of the medicinal mushrooms are uh, wild mushrooms, like they're tree mushrooms. Um, they actually grow on trees rather than out of the ground. Um, and uh, things like reishi, for example. And yeah, so, but yeah, they should be organic. Yeah. So right now, um, so the question was, what are the most powerful things to apply right now in this moment? One, we have a viral pandemic going on. Let's take advantage of some of these boosters. So garlic, I would say do garlic. Start with that. Um, essential oils are very easy uh, to get a hold of. Start doing those on a regular basis. Um, introduce, uh, um, I mean, a lot of these things you can introduce simultaneously. The things with medicinal mushrooms, that is something more of a long-term you know, thing. You've got to get used to taking it and that kind of thing. Um, and there are some other and some um, nutrients that have been recommended to take uh, specifically for um, the coronavirus. One of them is vitamin C. Uh, yeah, another one is elderberry extract. Elderberry extract. Um, there's uh, another one is zinc, um, and uh, there is actually in um, even in Holland Barrett at the moment an elderberry extract that you can buy, um, so you can get these online. <coughs> um, another um, one there was um, they have uh, oh spirulina as well, a spirulina. So this is one of the blue green algaes. Yeah. So this is, this is one that's been given specifically for um, helping f um, fight influenza and infection. Uh, it, it's been shown to lower the mortality rate of, of flu. So this is spirulina. Um, you can get that at just a standard health food store. It's an incredible food. Um, it contains practically every nutrient that we need. And uh, yeah, that can be introduced pretty much straight away in your diet. Right, time out. We need to finish here, I've been told, by the technical team. So um, to the online people, thank you for joining us wherever you are. I hope you stay safe and healthy. And to everyone here, also thank you. And let's stay safe and healthy. Until next time.